when we sing that, let incense arise, because he tells us that when we talk to him, when we present our prayers to him, that it, it's like incense to him, that it smells good. He says the incense is the prayers of the saints. When we bring the saints being everyone who loves him and has put their faith in him. He loves when we come together like this and bring our prayers to him, bring whatever's going on in our hearts to him. It pleases him. It's, it's sweet to him. Like a good conversation with someone that you love. Like when my little one, my little children run up to me and tug at my pants leg at two years old, you know, four years old. That's sweet to me. He says this is sweet to him. So anyways, good morning. My name is David. And, you know, for the, for the last couple of weeks, we've been doing some homework. We don't normally do homework. We might start normally doing homework. But we've, we've been consistently, at the end of every Sunday, we've been going home and having some homework, some, a book of the Bible to read and reflect on throughout the week. Uh, we read Ephesians last week, Galatians before that. And the reason that we've been doing that, the reason we've begun that is because we believe God is calling us to press into him with greater commitment, particularly by pressing into his word. And so to that end, with that in mind, both this morning and next Sunday, we're going to be reading Acts 10 and 11 all at once. Um, And the reason for that is that we want to really get into the meat of what God would say to us. And part of what we're we're trying to do too is have this serve as sort of a model for how you can read at home for your own time alone with the Lord. Because a lot of times the Bible can be intimidating to us. It's mysterious and wonderful and it is the word of God. And we let that intimidation keep us from actually opening it up. And so I pray that these next two Sundays help demystify things for you a little bit. Not because it isn't mysterious and wonderful, but because he promises he'll help us. So we don't have to be afraid, not because it's our own intellect guiding us, but because God is guiding us through it. He promises that he'll teach us. Okay, so get your Bibles. If you have it on your phone, if you have a paper Bible, I usually use my phone. I'm not, no, no shame in that. Um, and treat this like if you've just woken up, you know, maybe you have just woken up, but (laughs) treat this like you just rolled out of bed, you you get on your, on your couch or on chair in your living room or just sit up on your bed or whatever you do. And you've just opened your Bible. Maybe you've got your coffee in your hand. Let's put away our distractions. And now we're going to go and read all through Acts 10 and 11 and ask God to help us understand So, Father, we thank you for this invitation that you give us, that we can come and be taught by you. By your word, you say that you'll show us what's going on in our hearts. You'll give us wisdom with no reproach. You're not bothered that we ask you love when we ask you these things. And we just ask that now you'd open our eyes to your word and help us to understand what you would say to us, what's happening here, how it applies to us, and, and what you would speak to each of us individually this morning, Father. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 1, tells us, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And about the ninth hour of the day, that's like 3 p.m., he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. Think about that. This is the leader, a, a senior official in a Roman army. They, it takes a lot to make him afraid, right? He was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. So send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. 
And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants, a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey, he drew near to the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And when he became very hungry, he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened. An object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean, anything that wasn't kosher, clean, according to the Jewish customs. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius made an inquiry for Simon's house, stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, he's still confused, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went to the men who'd been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? They said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house to hear words from you. So he invited the men and lodged with them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them. Some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives, his close friends. And so as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also just a man. And as he talked to them, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to him, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I ask then, why did you call me? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa. Call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea, and when he comes, he'll speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. Now, therefore, we're all present before God to hear the things commanded you by God. Can you hear that they're both a little bit confused? Neither of them totally knows what's coming next. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. In every nation... Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, it was proclaimed throughout all Judea. It began in Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, because God was with him. And we are witnesses of the things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him. After he arose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets Witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who had heard, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They heard them speak with tongues, magnifying God. So Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. 
Now, the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And so when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contented with him, looking for a fight with him, saying, you went in with uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. In a trance, I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. And when I observed it intently and considered, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild beasts, the creeping things, the birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times. And all were drawn up again into heaven. And at that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brothers accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. So as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. So I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they became silent and glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. There's a lot going on here. That's why we're going to spread it out over these two weeks. There's there's different things God may have highlighted to you. May have been, you know, there's clearly something going on with the religious rituals, the religious rules. There's clearly an issue of racial divisions, of these different kinds of things, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles. There's these this experience of the tongues. But As I was preparing for today, and the thing that we're going to focus on this morning is the issue of this supernatural experience. Because it's even though it's not really the primary point, it kind of is running through everything. It's underneath everything. God changed their understanding of how people came to know him through this supernatural experience. And this is a weird thing that we're talking about. I mean, Peter saw animals let down in like a bed sheet, and then God said, kill it and eat it three times. This is a weird experience. And it, these kinds of places are where we get intimidated. You know, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. So I'm just going to, you know, I'll I'll pick it up another day. I'm not going to deal with that today. I've got things to do. This is weird. And we let it go and we let it keep us from pressing in. This is where we have opportunity to grow. This is where we have opportunity to to see God teach us. And so today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to dig in, looking to the scriptures to understand this area that otherwise can be really strange. So I've got three observations for us this morning. And the first thing to notice is pretty straightforward. Supernatural experiences, visions, and prophecy happen, right? I mean, Peter and Cornelius both have really strange supernatural experiences. And there are those who say that these kinds of visions are actually ungodly. They're, they're demonic. They're the enemy trying to deceive us, and we don't, need, we don't have any part in any sort of vision like this. Or people say, it's just a delusion. Peter just ate a mushroom with breakfast and he tripped out, and that's all it was. But it, it's easy for us to, to write these things off like that, but it just doesn't line up with what God says. One quarter of the Bible is prophecy, about one quarter. I think it's actually a little bit more than that. And within that, a lot of that came through really weird 
revelations. Ezekiel talks about these like, you know, angels that are, co- their whole body's covered in eyes and they have six wings and they just shout God's praises all the time. And it's just strange. It's really, you know, the book of Daniel is another, like half of it is all these stories. And then all of a sudden Daniel has all these crazy dreams and he's seeing beasts crawl out of the water. And God says, that's not an animal, that's grease. And you're like, it, you know, it, it's a kingdom that's, that represents, it's just weird. And it's hard for us to understand on our own. And again, these are places where we can recoil because it's uncomfortable or we can press in and ask God for understanding. And these sorts of experiences are not just Old Testament or just the disciples. They are not foreign to the people of God today. They may be, they're a little weird for, for us in the West a lot of times. And we can think, well, I haven't had this happen to me personally, so it's not real. But that, that's not the right way to look at this. One really beautiful example of this in modern times is happening right now a lot in the Muslim community. In, there's a quote we'll have on the screen that tells us, in 2007, Dudley Woodbury and others published a study that recounted interviews with 750 former Muslims who had converted to evangelical Christianity. Many of the reasons they gave for their conversion would be expected. The love of God, a changing view of the Bible, attraction to Christians who loved others. But one reason might come as a surprise, the experience of a dream they believed to be from God. These study results aren't isolated. Mission Frontiers magazine has reported that out of 600 Muslim converts, 25% experienced a dream that led to their conversion. And these dreams are things, I've, I've read through some of these stories that they're sharing. This is not an isolated incident. They're talking about, you know, Jesus comes and reveals himself in a dream and tells them to go look for a church or just tells them about himself. And then they, he uses circumstances to explain them to, to them later. And listen, think about this. This is, it says... 25% out of 600. It doesn't say 25 people out of 600. 25%, that's a quarter. That's 150. If we were in this room, we've got maybe 200 people. I don't think we have even close to that. Right now, we're trying to keep our, keep our numbers down, keep, keep our distancing, right? If that's 150 people, that'd be like 90% of the people in this room. Most of you, having on, the only reason that you're here being because Jesus himself showed up in a vision. It's happening today. This is now. It's, and it isn't super common in, in our culture. We see less of it. But I mean, I can tell you, I've had a couple of these experiences where God has revealed himself to me. One in particular where it was very similar to what I read about happening in these other countries a lot. It, happen, it tends to happen a lot in places where, where the church is oppressed because as it grows darker, Around us, the light is more visible. You know, he said it for part of the reason that I think we see this more in those countries is they're under such intense persecution. He's, it, you see these things more pronounced. But it's, it's hard for us to understand. And that, again, that drives us to the word. So look with me at 1 Corinthians here, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 27 tells us, now you, all who have trusted in Jesus, you are the body of Christ. Members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, Are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts. He doesn't say, it'd be really cool if you like had some spiritual gifts. He says, earnestly desire. It's something to seek, to pursue. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. And he goes on to say that excellent way is love. Chapter 13, verse 8 tells us, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Because right now we know in part. 
We prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. In the new creation, when Jesus returns and evil is done with, and we are sitting with him, seeing him face to face, we won't need a vision because he's there. But right now, we see in part, we prophesy in part. And so what this is showing us is that these gifts, these experiences of the power of God working through us, or him speaking to us supernaturally, are legitimate and good, worth seeking. God really did train and teach that those early, the first people in the church, Peter, Cornelius, through visions, through supernatural experiences. He still does today. Nowhere in scripture does he say that he will stop. Again, on the contrary, what he says is that as it grows darker, the light will be brighter. As we get closer to his return, we're going to see it more and more that through us, the spirit is, is really visible. You know, as we grow closer to him and as things grow more intense around us, that the church will be experiencing these gifts of the spirit more and more. But at the same time, we see in part. We prophesy in part. We experience these things in part. It's, it's, it's still through fallible vessels. I'm still messed up. I still don't see everything just right. And that brings us to point number two. These experiences have to be interpreted through Scripture. Do you realize that when you read your Bible on your phone, little paper Bible at home, whatever it is, that is a supernatural experience. He says that the word is alive and active. He says he's so closely identified with it. He says he set his word above his name. He says he is the word made flesh. And we take it so lightly, but it is, it is a supernatural experience. He will teach you. He will correct you and teach you and train you if you're willing to listen. Peter, who ate with Jesus and lived with Jesus and knew Jesus all these years in person, face to face, I mean, lived in the same town, grew up in the same town, who had these visions of Jesus, who would be led to, to write much of the scripture, tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, Verse 20, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Because prophecy never came by the will of man. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. He goes on, 1 John chapter 4, God continues to teach us. He says, Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. And just to be clear, we talked about this last week too, but this doesn't mean that the demons can't acknowledge that Jesus is who he is. There's lots of examples in scripture of the demons doing that. The point is that the liar, the enemy of your souls, will never agree with the truth. He's going to be twisting. He's never going to be submitted to the truth. He's going to be tweaking it. Did God really say? There's always that little adjustment of what is true. So he warns us in Colossians 2, 18. Let no one disqualify you. Insisting on asceticism, you know, the extra religious practices of you have to fast this many times a week, you got to wear uncomfortable clothes or shave your head or whatever it is. Insisting on asceticism, worship of angels, going on in detail about their visions. Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, his mind that is ruled by his senses rather than being, rather than holding fast to the head. From whom the whole body, 
nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. God himself teaches us that we are made for more than just reading about him. He wants us to grow with this growth that is from him, this life that is vibrant and real. And he tells us he's going to know us like a father with his children. It's a close relationship. That is more than a book. My kids don't know about me. My kids know me. They don't just read what I write. But they do know my voice. We can't know his voice if we don't listen to what he's already said. And our hearing is bad. So it's really easy for us to get confused. It's really easy for us to buy into lies, to, to let people disqualify us, to let the liar disqualify us. And this is why we have to go back to what's sure. We have to start with the foundation of his word. His word, he was not going to deny himself. What he's already written is steadfast. It's trustworthy. So if I hear something from, from someone else, spiritual or physical, whatever, right? If I, if I have an idea that is contrary to the scripture, I know it's not from him because it doesn't agree with what he's already said. His word teaches us what he sounds like. doesn't mean he's not going to say more than what he's written, but it's never going to disagree with what he's already said. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus told us that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. So if we look back at what Peter was doing here, right? He, all throughout his supernatural experiences, you see him connecting the dots to what God had already said. God gives him this vision of the food, right? And tells him, that, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. And this tied right back to what God had shown him, what Jesus had said to him face to face in Mark chapter 7. He said, do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside can't defile him? It doesn't enter his heart. It enters his belly, and it's eliminated, thus purifying all foods. He said, what comes out of a man, this is what defiles him. Because from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. These things come from within. That's what defiles a man. Your breakfast is fine. It doesn't matter if you eat bacon with breakfast or not. That's not the point. When Peter met with Cornelius, he remembered this. He said, God in every nation, he's like, it doesn't, it's not about the appearance. It's not about where you're from. It's not about your culture. In it. It's about the heart. Everyone who fears God, he accepts. He's, he's so willing to receive whoever would look to him through Christ. And this promise, it had become lost in some ways to some of the people who Peter was surrounded by. To, the, to the, the Israelites that had grown to miss this idea to some degree, thinking that they, they tended to not remember that God had told them he would make them a light to the nations. He had sent them in to, to bring justice to some areas, some cultures that had been so destructive that they needed to be removed. But everywhere they went, he, God brought people into his family who weren't Israelites brought in the lineage of Jesus. There's so many who were not Israelites, Rahab and Ruth and uh, so many others. It's, it, there's this, God had this plan throughout history to bring people to himself from every culture. And so when Peter went back to the Jewish believers in chapter 11, he's reminding them, this is, this is always the plan. God's promise is consistent. This isn't out of line with what God has already showed us. And again, this illustrates for us, if you're going to recognize God speaking to you and leading you places beyond just the written word, first you have to know him through what he's already said. You have to know him. To be able to go into those uncharted places safely, you have to be rooted in what is safe. Like a vine can't grow without structure. You need to have that structure. You need to have that core support to flourish. You need to have that core. And that drives us toward the third point, the final point. We need to seek the Lord 
through his word and through prayer. He makes a point of letting us know that both Peter and Cornelius had these supernatural experiences during deliberate times of prayer. How often do you talk to him? How often are you listening to him in prayer, reading what he's already spoken? Again, desire it. He will work through you and teach you. He promises to. And just consider this with me. What could be better than spending time with the one whose identity, whose nature is love. He tells us that he is love. And I mean, you could take the whole week and just sit with that, just chew on what that means. Because it doesn't mean, it's not our little emotional, fluffy, you know, chemical reaction in our brain's idea of love. It's so much richer than that. It, it does involve the justice that protects his people, the justice that judges what is, what is evil and opposed to the truth. It's the source of his joy and humor. I hope you can hear that in some of those verses. He, Jesus is funny. He, has, he invented funny. It's his idea. He's so creative and humorous and tender. And he has these different things that are all expressions of the fact that his identity is love. You don't know anyone else who is love. Only he is love. And he invites you to sit with him and be taught by him about how to do today, how to go through your life. He promises to train you and shape you and recreate you. So it is worth our time. He's worthy of it. And there's no quota in his love. He doesn't tell us you need to do you know, seven prayers a day. You need to read through Genesis to Revelation every year. He doesn't give us rules like that. What he does give us are principles. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18, says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Psalm 105, verse 4 says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Seek his face continually, depending on how, how it's translated. The Hebrew there is really his face. Press. He tells us right now, it's like we're looking through a dirty window, through a glass dimly. He says, but, but press in. Seek it anyways. Get you know up against the glass. Get close. Because he tells us in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Erica, you can make your way back up. You know, this is something you may not sense a ton. A lot of times I've found that when I ask God to guide me and I'm, I'm seeking him, in the moment I may not sense very much. I'll look back and realize how much he was doing, how, how, how involved he was, how much he was leading me and teaching me and how present he was in everything. But in the moment, sometimes, you don't, sometimes it's amazing and I'm aware, like I said, I mean, there's been once or twice where there's like, it was a supernatural experience. There have been these times where like Jesus is talking to me. Most of the time, I'm not really aware of like, oh, you know, that was Jesus. You know, I'm just feeling him. He's just guiding my direction. I look back and I realize how much he was present. Like when I push my daughter in the shopping cart, she thinks she's in charge, you know. But she's, but I'm, you know, she gives, she talks to me about it and she has her, her input and it, you know, I love the connection, but I'm still guiding it. I'm still, you know, she may ask me if we can go down the aisle, down the toy aisle and we do that, but I'm driving. She thinks she's driving, but I'm driving. Do you think you're driving? And God will let you do some stuff. But if you seek him, you'll look back and you realize how much he's directing, how much he's guiding, how present he is. And one last little note on that. Look again, think again about Paul and Cornelius, or um, Peter and Cornelius, excuse me. 
they had these really regular rhythms here. And I think it's, it's such a good reminder for us. Cornelius had this, it tells us he did it. it was, his fasting schedule was so known that the city knew about it. You know, it was like everybody told when they come to Peter, they're like, he, he prays throughout the week. You know, he's fasting throughout the week and he's giving alms. And the Bible tells us he did, it wasn't a show. He was doing it because he feared God. It wasn't about him putting on the show of it. But he just, it seems like maybe he skipped breakfast and lunch. You know, by 3 p.m. it sounds like he may have been finishing up a couple times a week, two or three times a week. He had this built into his rhythm of the week that he set that time aside to seek the Lord. Peter was just waiting for lunch. Lunch was cooking and he was hungry, so he's like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go pray, because I don't want to smell the food, you know. And so he he took his time and he's just seeking the Lord in that time throughout the regular rhythm of the day. I mean, for me, I try regularly to, you know, when I wake up in the morning. I try to make it pretty much the first thing I do that I'm reading through a section of scripture and asking God about it. And a lot of times I'll see him use it as I'm going throughout my day, but it's just a way to sit and be with him and hear from him from what he's already read, what he's already written and, and talk with him. And then a lot of times I like to use my car rides and stuff. You know, I, my kids go to school in Hollywood, so it's a 45 minute car ride. So I've got time to be alone, you know, like Peter waiting for lunch. I'm just sitting and praying and maybe I'll put on, a, you know, listen to the audio Bible or maybe, you know, listen to some worship music and just use that as part of your daily rhythm. You know, I know that, okay, on Thursday at 4 p.m. I've got a car ride, so I'm going to talk to you in that time, God, you know, and have that built in in addition to your just daily rhythm. He tells us he has set these things up, so many little things in our world to direct our hearts to him, that creation declares his glory, that one day tells of him to another that the rain providing for our food, that it, it testifies of his goodness. He hasn't forgotten about you. The rain comes again tomorrow. The cool weather is going to roll in again this week. And let that direct your heart to the fact. Let that be a reminder of him smiling at you. That sense of he is present. He sees you and he loves you. So we're gonna, Eric is going to sing a new song for us. And this one is not really like a sing-along kind of song. So as we, as she sings, take this time instead to reflect. This, the song is reflecting on the fact that God is near and he speaks to us through these different ways. He's present. He's, he is revealing himself to us in so many different ways. So take the time to reflect on that through the words and Look for where he's giving you opportunities throughout your day. Today, tomorrow, throughout the week, look for the opportunities that he's giving you to, to hear his voice, to sense his presence, his smile, his guidance. I can hear it in the crackle of a palm fire. I can hear it in the middle of the ocean water I just can't explain it But it makes me want to cry I can hear it when the rain falls on my windowsill On a playground where children's laughter just can't explain her but it makes me want to cry oh, I can hear it in the busy 